um, sorry, go ahead. That's right. So, so, so we um, understand that untreated pain is often associated with poor health outcomes and it affects um, a resident or a patient by decreasing their function. So reducing their ability to shower, toilet, be independent, um, decreasing their quality of life. So they're no longer able to undertake activities or enjoy time, times doing activities or with their friends and family. Um, it's often associated with anxiety and depression, particularly over the long term. Um, and it can disrupt their sleep. So they can have difficulty sleeping due to pain or they can often wake often with pain. Um, it can impact on their mobility. So they're more at risk of falls because of their balance is off. Um, and it's also associated with social isolation. So they, they often become quite withdrawn into themselves or unable to focus on others or activities. So we're going to look at how do we treat pain? What, what is the most effective management of pain, I guess? So our mainstay of treatment um, of pain is usually the use of analgesia, um, but not the only treatment. Uh, the choice of analgesia is usually based on the type and the severity of pain. So mild pain is usually managed using analgesia um, and our probably two main analgesics are paracetamol and non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, the most common of that being ibuprofen or Nurofen, as you might know it. Um, in palliative care, the use of a weak opioid such as codeine is limited in its use, and that's because it's got quite a low ceiling dose and it's got a limit to the fact that we can't escalate it up as pain increases. Um, and codeine itself has its quite... Um, side effect of constipation is quite marked. Uh, tramadol, so it's another drug that we don't use a lot of and its adverse effects is because it's limited in its escalation of dosages. Um, and it's also the potential for drug interactions is high with tramadol. Uh, Non-steroidals can be used for moderate pain. So that's due to inflammation and tissue injury. Um, and we often use that with uh, say metastatic bone pain. Um, and I know that um, in some other countries, they also use it for people with fever, uh, dental pains, things like that. Uh, opioids may be required for moderate to severe pain. And the most common opioids that we use in palliative care are morphine, oxycodone, fentanyl, and hydromorphone. So if we're gonna look at some of the non-pharmacological interventions, um, so some of the most common are the use of heat or cold. You might've used heat or cold packs, immobilization, particularly in things like uh, fractures um, or massage may help to relieve pain and are often used in conjunction with pharmacological management um, as well as other adjuvant medications, which are used to help sort of help the effect of the um, opioid. Um, the non Pharmacological interventions can be combined with the use of analgesia um, or used individually. So generally the cause of any pain in palliative care is likely to have a combination of different mechanisms that respond to different analgesias. And that's why we often use um, a multi sort of system approach really. If a resident or patient has an element of uropathic or nerve pain, we can use multiple medications to be effective in assisting with pain management. The most common that we use are the anti-epileptic medications such as pregabalin and gabapentin for nerve pain, corticosteroids, so such things like dexamethasone or prednisolone. Um, they've also got an anti-inflammatory effect. Antidepressants such as amitriptyline that we often use with, we can use with nerve pain or nerve blocks or topical anesthetics that are becoming a little bit more popular like lignocaine patches can also be helpful. So the other thing that we're going to look at is opioid rotation, opioid rotation. And so why do we need to consider it? And, that, and what do we actually mean by that? So opioid rotation, um, it may be required for the following reasons. So in residents or patients that have um, poor kidney function, so the kidneys aren't working very well, um, 
and impaired liver function as well. Um, that can mean that some of the medications that we use um, are not um, sort of broken down in the body properly and then excreted. Um, someone who's experiencing um, a rapid increase in their pain, may we may look at rotating the opioid or has a re poor response, obviously, to a current um, analgesia or opioid they're on or to manage severe adverse effects of the current opioid they're taking. So if they're experiencing lots of nausea and vomiting, um, then we might change that as well. Sometimes the resident or patient will require a change of the route of the medication as well. And the most common thing that we change from is an oral medication to a subcut medication, or, you know, as an example of patches, so to a transdermal route as well. Um, the changing from an oral to a subcut often is required at the end of life for a resident or patient who's now unable to swallow, but it can occur at other times as well. So probably the most common uh, times that we would rotate uh, from an oral to a subcut is when people have difficulty swallowing their medications or if they've got severe nausea and vomiting, uh, if they've got a bowel obstruction, so often that comes with vomiting, so they can't absorb their medications anymore. Or for patients with changes in cognition, say a delirium or a dementia, where they no longer able to swallow. So I think it's important that when we're talking about um, rotation of an opioid, we need to understand the mechanism of, of, of absorption um, of medications orally. And we call that first pass metabolism. Um, and that's the amount of drug that is lost during the process of oral absorption. So taking something in um, doesn't mean that they're going to um, necessarily get all that medication throughout the body. And the reason is that the uh, medication is, is absorbed in the digestive system and enters the hepatic portal system. So basically goes into the liver. The liver then acts as a filter. And um, sometimes they um, the, the drug is taken like that, drug is actually um, to a large extent um, filtered so that um, there's only a small amount of the ac active medication that emerges from the liver to the rest of the body. Therefore, in many cases, this first pass metabolism through the liver reduces the concentration or availability of the medication in the body. So that's really important to remember just when we're looking at, we're gonna look at rotation. And the drugs that experience a significant first pass effect or reducing concentration are morphine, diazepam, which is Valium, and midazolam, which are medications we use quite commonly, particularly at end of life. So first pass metabolism only occurs with the use of oral medications, as you can understand. Um, so the medications that swallowed and absorbed by the digestive system. So it doesn't affect medications that are taken subcutaneously, which is our most common way to administer um, uh, injectable medications, uh, either patches, doesn't affect patches, it doesn't uh, affect buccal or sublingual, so medication that's taken, um, absorbed through the mucosa of the mouth, or intranasal sprays, intrathecal or epidural, so injections into the um, uh, epidural or intrathecal space in the spine, or intravenous or intramuscular injections. So they all avoid the first pass metabolism. So if we're looking at um, if we're looking at um, rotation and first pass metabolism, why why is it important? The most important thing to remember is that when you're going from an oral medication to a subcut, you reduce the amount of medication to be given because you don't want to cause um, the body to um, have a reaction or become opioid toxic. So that sort of not an overdose, but actually have too much opioid on board. Uh, we're not gonna to go too much into the drug calculations, but it's important to remember that if you're going from oral to subcut, the dose will be much smaller. So just think about that. If someone's on an oral medication and they're gonna to go to a subcut, we expect that it's going to be smaller. So um, it is re it's recommended when converting from oral, say oral morphine, to a subcut morphine that we would divide it by three. So if you've got 30 milligrams of morphine orally, so for example, in 
if you someone's having MS cotton 15 twice a day, um, and we're going to add up that whole 24 hour dose, that'll be 30 milligrams of morphine orally in the day, then they would only go on to 10 milligrams of morphine subcut. So that would be for the whole day. So if you were starting a syringe driver, you'd start them at 10. Um, but we do also do something else, which we'll show in the next slide. Uh, so we talked about getting that total 24 hour dose. So that's important, number one. We always look at our medications that patients or residents are on and we calculate the total 24 hour dose of the opioid. So if they're on MS cotton 15 twice a day, then that means they'll be on a total daily dose of 30 of oral morphine. But then they might've had a couple of breakthroughs of 2.5 milligrams of ordine. Um, so they have two doses of that. So that's another five milligrams. So the total daily dose would be 35 milligrams for the day. All right. Um, if they were on say oxycodone or fentanyl or another medication, we always convert it to the oral morphine equivalent. And we do that by using the opioid conversion ratio guidance document that's been put out by Safer Care Victoria. I'm not sure whether you use that in aged care, but that's the document that it's a new document um, in February of this year. And everyone in palliative care, we're trying to encourage to use the same document because we're going to get the same calculations. And then because of the, we talked about the first pass um, going through the liver for orals, you dose reduce for incomplete cross tolerance by 25 to 50%. Generally in pal care, we reduce by 30%. So we divide that by a third. But in some places, if someone's elderly and frail and you know they haven't been absorbing, you might dose reduce by 50%. Probably just a little bit of practice that we do that. And then we calculate, calculate the new medication for 24 hours. And then we always make sure they've got a short acting breakthrough dose, which is one sixth to one tenth of the total 24 hour dose. So we've got 10 milligrams of morphine in a syringe driver. Then we divide that by six to 10 and we'd only give a subcut dose of, you know, one to two or something. Okay. We do also look at, um, sorry, we do also look at the um, breakdown of ampules and things just to make um, things a bit easier as well. So we always say never do calculations on your own, always ask for help. So we do that, like even as a clinical nurse consultant, I always check my calculations with someone. So it's always important. If you're doing calculations and rotations, it's always good to check. Okay, so um, when a resident or patient has been rotated on an opioid, it's very important that you um, keep checking them. So people vary in their response to the effects of different op opioids. So ongoing pain assessment is essential, especially after converting someone from one medication to another or from, from oral to subcut. So we want to monitor the effectiveness of the new opioid and make sure the resident is able to tolerate it. We want to monitor them for opioid toxicity. So to make sure they haven't got too much opioid on board. So we look at, you know, responding are they you know still able to respond to you do they have pinpoint pupils are they confused is their breathing slowing down like getting a bit of a picture of what they're like uh, we want we want to monitor, monitor for odd adverse effects so is it causing nausea vomiting um, you know checking to see what's happening with them um, we always have we always prescribe a bowel protocol with opioids, always. At end of life, it's a bit different, but we want to be checking to see that they've had their bowels open. Um, and finally, often at end of life, particularly, patients may become quite agitated and we're not quite sure what it is. Always check whether they've got a full bladder because they may have urinary retention or they may be constipated. They may have a full bowel. So that's important to check. So our take-home message is, Always explore pain and believe the patient or resident. Um, we should be using meticulous assessment processes. And I know in aged care, they do do that. Like they've often got very good pain assessments and do them regularly. Um, make sure that residents and patients are having their analgesia regularly and as prescribed. 
Um, ensure that there is something that you can give them for incident and breakthrough pain. So if someone's on some pain relief long acting, then they should always have a short acting um, breakthrough pain prescribed. And that means if someone's on a syringe driver, then there needs to be something prescribed for them to have for breakthrough if they get pain. Always attempt to relieve pain and other symptoms. So we always say assess, manage, evaluate, and assess again. And finally, don't be afraid to ask for help from the experts.